You're great in your love for us. You're great in your goodness to us. And so God, we come today in response to your greatness. And we devote ourselves to you. God, I pray through this worship time that we, you, our hearts would be open. And I pray as we dig into your word today, that we would hunger and thirst for you in a way that only, in a, with, a, with a hunger and a thirst that only you can create inside of us, that we would be open to your reframing of who we are. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Children, you guys are dismissed to Children's Church. And as you do, check out this video. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. If, like I said earlier, if you didn't hear me, if you, we haven't met, my name is Jason. I'm the pastor of here at Faith Discovery Church, and it's an honor that you've uh, chosen to be here this morning. I also want to say to hello to everybody joining us online. Uh, good morning. We're glad you're here. Uh, hope that you're able to not only engage the service, but engage each other, because church is best when we do it together. Church is best when we're in community. And uh, I have not been been here for a couple of weeks. Uh, I was in, uh, in Turkey and in Greece, journeying through some of the cities that you read about in the Bible and that Paul visited and that John writes to in the book of Revelation. And uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Jerry for, for sharing, for speaking the last couple of weeks. Thank you so much for doing that. I hope you were in, able to enjoy uh, his word. And, but it's really good to be back. I'm really excited to be back. I'm so excited to be back. I got to rein it in a little bit, uh, but also want to thank the lead team and all of you for making it possible for me to, to uh, study and, and, and travel to learn. Uh, it's been an incredible uh, opportunity for me to travel to those cities and learn. We will, I will uh, be unpacking these in the near future and talking more about my trip and uh, we'll even do a, uh, in the, in the not so distant future, we'll do a study of the cities uh, that, that John writes to in Revelation. And uh, this trip was pivotal in me learning more and more about these cities and what's happening in those letters. But that's not for today. Today, we start a new series that we will talk about. Uh, the ten, this summer, we're gonna talk about the 10 commandments and principally the Sinai experience. Um, in the opening of to the book, The Voyage of the Dawn Trader, C.S. Lewis crafts an, a, a really captivating scene. If you know anything about the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, uh, as we get to this book, the, the four children are now down to really Edmund and Lucy, and they've been to Narnia, and now they're back to regular life. In fact, they're spending their summer at their cousin uh, Eustace's house, and they're quite bored about it. They're kind of stuck up in his attic and they're, one day they're lamenting that they're stuck with him for the summer and they're, they'd ra much rather be someplace interesting like Narnia. And they, they, they happen in their, their discussions and in their eyes, they gaze upon a picture, a picture that kind of looks like a Narnian boat out on the sea. And that really just makes them long more for it. And so they're staring at this picture and they're talking about it. And their cousin Eustace overhears them and he starts mocking them for their hope of being somewhere else. But as they, as the more they stare at this picture, the more they look into what's going on, they, they kind of fall silent. And something quite peculiar happens. They start to, it almost feels like the picture starts to move. 
And they can see, it's like they can see the waves starting to crash against the boat. And, and the, they, they start to hear sounds. It sounds like the boat uh, slicing through the waters. And they can smell the fresh air that so many of us will smell this summer when we vacation down the shore. And, and so they... they this, this picture is, is starting to come alive and suddenly, as it is out of nowhere, water starts to splash on them. And, and it, the water pours through the picture frame. And in a matter of moments, they're not in a bedroom. They're not in an attic. They're, they're grasping for air in the tumultuous Narnian Sea. The, the picture becomes alive to them and now they're in the story. Perhaps without meaning to, and quite frankly, knowing a little bit about C.S. Lewis, maybe he was meaning that. He demonstrated the nature of Scripture. You see, at first glance, the Bible can, just, can be just a book. It can be a long book that we've heard about or that we've seen in pictures and, and in ancient text. But the more we look at the Bible... And how it tells us of lands and people long ago and far and away. The more we look at it, the more we stare into it, the more we focus on it, it comes to life and even sweeps us and brings us into the story. This summer as a church, we're gonna investigate the sign, what happened at Mount Sinai, the mountain where the ancient Israelites met their God, our God, named Yahweh. David referenced it just a, a few minutes ago. Yahweh was his name. It means I am. Yahweh's name is just a sign of his existence. There's no limit to him. And so the, the, the Israelites, they come to this mountain and we're gonna revisit their story as they trudge through the wilderness from a grueling past and, and into a promising future. I'm guessing that none of us I've ever been to Sinai in person. But as we read about it this summer, as we talk about it, and the people who lived there more than 3,000 years ago, who spoke a different language and lived with a radically different rhythm, had different values, different customs, had different concerns, I believe there's a good chance that some of us will feel like we're transported there. See, the differences of the Israelites but from us uh, cannot erase the fundamental connection between their ancient story and ours. And so I'm hoping, I'm praying that as we walk this summer, collectively, you and I, and personally you and I, will be drawn into this biblical story, much like Lucy and Edmund. And we'll find that this biblical story is very much alive and that you and I are part of it and that it's part of our story. And so as we begin to explore Sinai, we're, and principally we'll talk about the 10 commandments. Let's start by beginning our reading from Exodus chapter 19. We'll do a lot of reading from Exodus 19 today, um, just to let you know, but we'll start with verses one and two. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And so to set the stage, to give you a kind of background of what's happening here, about 600,000 people have left, have been freed, have left Egypt and the Egyptian oppression, and they've been out in the desert for about two months somewhere between 45 to 60 days. And uh, the Exodus, the, by the way, just to, uh, if you wanted to read, and I encourage you to read the book of Exodus, but the Exodus of the Israelites from Egypt begins in, in chapter 12, Exodus 12. And they're headed out from Egypt towards a promised land that none of them have ever been to. It's a promised land. It's a land called Canaan. And, uh, Egypt to Canaan, as we know it now, is about 250 miles. 
If they had walked a direct path, it should have taken them less than two weeks. But that was not God's intent. You know, David referenced earlier as he was leading worship at the end, how sometimes we can be really task-oriented as, uh, as Americans. We want to get there. I tra- like I said, I traveled to, to Europe th- uh, these past couple of weeks, and the flight was... The, long, the major part of the flight each way was about 10 and a half hours. And it was 10 and a half hours of misery. I could tell you that that 10 and a half hours, I longed to get where we were going. I wanted that flight to be over. I can understand the, the Israelites walking through the desert and wanting to get to Canaan. But God had other uh, uh, plans in store. And so he brings them not first to Canaan, their promised land, but first to Sinai, where they will encounter God. When God leads us, when we come to faith, when we come to uh, realize who God is in our lives, there will be times where he will take us on journeys and that journey won't always be direct to where we want to go, but he will do it and lead us in such a way so that we will learn to encounter him. And so the Israelites are going on this journey and for two months they walk and they get to this mountain. Um, We see in Exodus 13, 21, that God led them using a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he leads them into the Sinai desert. Now, just an aside. Sometimes we, I, I can read this text and I can see that God led them with a very tangible expression of his presence. They saw a cloud in the daytime and they saw a fire at night. And there can be a sense that sometimes when I struggle to know where God's leading me, it's like, why can't he just, why can't he show up and be obvious to me like that? You ever been there wondering what's the next step? And you're like, God, where am I going? And you read this and you're like, well, it was easy for them. This isn't part of the signing experience thing, but let me just speak to that for a second. One of the differences between the experience of the Israelites, one of the reasons that they had to have a tangible expression of God's presence that they could see was they had not yet understood, they had not experienced the presence of God in them. Through the work, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and promise of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And so we don't have to look to the skies to see some kind of direction. God's presence dwells in you, lives in you. No outside expression needs to happen. Now, sometimes that's difficult and you have to learn the voice of that. There's a learning, there's an understanding of learning the voice of God to us as we seek him and as he directs us. But there's no need for an outside expression because the expression is part of who we are. That's a gift of God. Jesus said, I'm going to send the gift. The gift is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So, uh, but that's just a side. In the 60 days between leaving Egypt and arriving at Mount Sinai, the Israelites experienced the following. And those of you who grew up in Sunday school or in kids' church, you may have heard some of these. Some of you have never had a church experience or read the Bible, and you don't know this. But uh, if you've seen movies like the, the Prince of Egypt or those kinds of things, these things will f- seem familiar to you. The first thing we read about is in Exodus 13. It's the crossing of the Red Sea. As Pharaoh and the army of Egypt is chasing them, the uh, Israelites are grumbling and they uh, even express a desire to go back to slavery. And Moses communes with, uh, talks with God and God tells him to walk out into the ocean, sticks his staff out of the ocean and the Red Sea parts and, and Israel walks through. They've experienced this. The first thing we see, read about them is they see that God will provide protection in the wilderness. After protection, they walk to the, they, they go three days without water in the desert. And they begin to question their deci- uh, Moses' decision. By the way, three days without water in the desert will cause you to question whether you've made the right decision. And they come, ac- ac- come upon a place called Mara. And they find water and the water is bitter. 
Bitter water, no matter how thirsty you are, isn't good for you. But God makes the water drinkable and they experience provision in the wilderness. But they're hungry. We find in Exodus 16 that God provides manna and quail for them to eat. In Exodus 17, they're thirsty again and God draws water from a rock. In Exodus, later in Exodus 17, um, they, they are attacked by a, a, a nation called the Amalekites. And they're at war, and you may have heard this story. As long as Moses' arms are up, they win. If his arms fall, they lose. And so Aaron and Hur lift his arms, and they defeat the Amalekites. And so they come to Mount Sinai, a place they've never seen before. They arrive, when they arrive there, they arrive as a nation of grumblers. A people who have seen God repeatedly deliver them and provide them for them, but there are people who do not fully grasp the power of God and, he, and the purpose that he has for them. They're grumblers. But there's one of them has been there before. See, for Moses, this isn't the first time he's been at Sinai. Moses' arrival at Mount Sinai is a return. He's been there before. Do you know the last time he was there? The account is found in Exodus 3, and it wasn't called, and the mountain was named with a different name. It wasn't called Sinai in Exodus 3. It's called Hareb, but it's the same mountain, and it's the location of Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. Moses comes to Sinai with with a sense of familiarity. He's returning to this place of revelation. You see, at Mount, at Mount Harab, when he meets the burning bush, it's the first time in recorded history we see God's name re- referenced. Moses approaches the burning bush and God starts to talk to him. And Moses reveal, receives this revelation from God. And the revelation from God that Moses receives is available to all of us because it's about relationship with God. When God engages Moses at Harab, he tells him his name. And he gives them a purpose. He says, my name is Yahweh. I am. And he says, and go back to Egypt, because you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses, much like the Israelites will later, immediately starts reflecting on his restrictions. I can't do that because I stutter. I can't lead those people. But in that moment... God in his grace and in his mercy says to Moses, go, I'll provide help for you. I'll even give you a voice. Through my power, you'll lead. And so he he learns that God will provide above his weaknesses. And so as he arrives, as we get to the time where he's leading the Israelites back to Sinai, can you imagine what he might be thinking? You see, it was there that he met Yahweh, and it's here that the people he's leading will have the same opportunity. Let's continue reading from Exodus 19, starting at verse 3. The Lord, then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt. And how I have carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be, a king for, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders and the people, uh, elders of the people, and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord says to Moses, I'm going to come to you on a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. We're going to skip down to verse 16 next. On the evening of the third day, there was thunder and lightning With a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, everyone in the camp trembled. 
Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended it to, on it with, in fire. The smoke billowed up like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sa- as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended on top of Mount Sinai and called to Moses on top of the mountain. Moses must have been so excited. It was happening. His people were going to experience what he had experienced. He had, you can imagine, he must have talked about the burning bush. Listen, I was in the desert one day, just out of nowhere, just minding my sheep, nothing. He had spent 18 years after fleeing from Egypt. He's on a regular day just guarding the sheep that aren't his. And out of nowhere, on a normal day, God appears. And he sees this bush. It's not being consumed by the fire. Can you imagine if you had that experience and God talks, started talking to you out of a, bur- of a bush that's on fire? How many people you would talk to about that story? First of all, the first couple of people you probably wouldn't tell. That's weird. I don't know if I'm telling anybody. They might think bad things about me. Might think I ate bad pizza or something. But over time, as he starts to see God do all the things he said God was going to do, he must have talked about it. But now he's seeing them, seeing them experience it. He's bringing them to the place of revelation. He must have been so excited for his people. You, you're not going to believe what it's like when we get there. It's like taking a person to Disney World, though, and you've been there and they haven't. You're not going to believe. It's amazing. He must have been so anticipatorily thinking about what could happen. They were going to experience the revelation of a relationship with God. But we skip to Exodus 20, verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to, us your, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, whoa, whoa, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and to keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God, where God was. The, gumber, the, the grumbling Israelites were so focused on their fear, on their restrictions, that they, uh, and they didn't have a previous, the previous experience that Moses had. He was returning to this place of revelation. He was focused on the revelation that comes from a relationship with Yahweh. When we fo- when you focus on your disappointments, when you focus on things that hinder your expectations, when we focus on our restrictions, We deny ourselves the opportunity to receive a revelation from God. They were so focused on what they wanted and what they didn't want and how their expectations weren't being met that they chose not to meet with God when they had the opportunity. God calls all of Israel up on the mountain and they're so scared that they say, Moses, you go for me. It's not the only time in Scripture that we see God inviting. It's not the only time in Scripture where people that are given an opportunity to respond or not. In Revelation chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 20, John writes, he's writing to a bunch of different churches. And he's telling them the words of Jesus. In in chapter chapter 3, verse 20, it says, uh, John writes, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I'll eat with that person and they with me. John wrote those words 
to the, peop- uh, to the people in the church of a town co- or a city called Laodicea. Jesus is talking, he's, he's, he's saying, Jesus is talking to his people, people he loves, people he desires to be in relationship with. Notice that invitation. Let's leave that up there, please. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, what will happen? I'll come in and I'll eat with that person. I'm going to sit down at a table and share food. You know what happens over the table? You share life. You talk about your stories. You get to know each other. Food is wonderful for bringing community together. It's this incredible opportunity to talk. And it takes time, especially in, in, in Jewish tradition, in first century Palestine, to have eaten together would take time. We see some of this in European cultures today. I haven't been to Spain, but I hear lunchtime in Spain takes a long time. In fact, it takes so long and you get so tired after eating and sharing that you need to take a nap. Because it's not just about the consumption of food. It's about the experience of sharing things together. And that's what Jesus is inviting people to in Revelation chapter 3. Let's share life together. I want to know you. The creator of the universe wants to know us, invites us in. He invites us to the mountain. And sometimes we're so focused on the things that distract us that we miss the invitation to commune with God. I visited Laodicea last week, and as I learned about the city and the people who lived there, the things they did and the things they were known for. It changed the way I understood the letter that John wrote. What I now know, what I'm learning is this letter. We look at Revelation as a whole big book. And for some of us, it's quite scary. It's got incredible themes. It's got weird things about it that we don't understand. People have told us all different things that these things mean. But at the beginning of this book, there's letters to seven churches. And what that would have happened is they would have passed this letter around. And they, Laodicea is in this valley. And uh, you can actually, it's, it's, it's in between Colossae, which we would know uh, the Colossians live there, the book of Colossians. So you could see Colossians from Laodicea and you can see Herapolis, Hermopolis, which is another city just across the valley. And these three cities, you could see all three of these places. And so people would have known what's going on in Laodicea. It was a very rich city. It was the Beverly Hills of ancient Roman culture. In fact, it was the place that produced the linens that the Roman emperor would wear. The clothes that Caesar would wear came from Laodicea. They were known for their nice stuff. They were so wealthy that uh, in the first century, an earthquake destroys the city. It levels it. And they say to Rome, we don't need your money. Rome offers to give them money to rebuild. They say, no, we don't need your money. We'll rebuild ourselves. It's a city that's very wealthy. But the letter, having visited some of these cities, I realize now I'm learning how intimate and personal the letter speaks directly to their way of life. You know what it's like? It's like being invited to dinner with somebody. Like Jesus is standing, inviting them to dinner, and then he talks very intimately to each city about their life. Jesus knows us intimately and wants to share life with us. John writes to them about Jesus in uh, in an extremely insightful way and tells them that Jesus is wanting to engage and commune with them. And it was an unbelievable change in the way the world would have understood deities. 
especially the Gentiles of the group. God wants to eat with us. God comes to us. God invites us in. It was a world of known deities. There were tons of statues and gods that were worshiped and you went to them and you sacrificed to them. And here's what would happen. Uh, You would buy things for them and you would take them to the temple and you would leave the sacrifice for the, for the temple. And the temple would then sell that to the vendor. And the vendor would sell it to the next person who would then take it back to the temple. Who would, and that's how the money grew. Because you'd bring a little statuette to the God and leave it there. And they'd sell the statuette to the person to sell it right back to you. You might buy later in the day the thing you sacrificed in, to the God in the morning. And in the middle of this world where it's all about commerce and and goods and money and you giving up and you giving up and you giving up and you don't know anything, Jesus comes and changes the way you can think of a deity because he says, I want to come to your house and commune with you and get to know you and to be present with you and talk to you about the intimate things in your life. And so we come with this invitation. but will we miss the invitation because we're so distracted by the things around us? Maybe there are faults. Maybe there are things that we don't think we're good enough in. Maybe there are comparison games where we don't think we are as good as someone else. Or maybe we think we're unworthy. Or maybe we think we're not capable enough. Or maybe we think someone's better than us. If, you've, if you think any of those things, you're not alone. You've, we've just described exactly what the Israelites were thinking. God's been through this before. He's heard all of the reasons someone's not capable of engaging and communing with him. And he's given answers for all of them. They've all been provided. There is nothing you can do to separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus. I told you I came back ready. And so as a church, we begin to explore the 10 commandments and we, as we investigate the Sinai experience, let me encourage you to where you come to a place of expectation, a place where you expect the revelation of a relationship with God. A place where you let go of all of the things that make you not good enough or not special enough, or not holy enough, or not well-behaved enough to keep you from getting to know Yahweh. Put those things aside and come with an expectation that, God, that you don't just learn about God, but that you get to relation, relate with God in an intimate, special way this summer. Let me encourage you to come to a place like Lucy and Edwin, where the scriptures come alive. This morning, as we make our way to communion, I challenge each of you individually, and I challenge us as a church collectively to refocus our our attention away from the restrictions that deny us the opportunity so that we can experience a revelation and relationship with God. Would you pray with me? Jesus.